Hi, this is Paul, and this is a conversation a lot of people have been waiting for. Uh, Jordan B. Cooper, as opposed to Jordan B. Peterson, every time I type it into Twitter, I got to choose between the two of you, um, has <laughs> in some ways been doing a parallel thing with me, and uh, we've never spoken. I, I've, I've seen your videos come across from the algorithm many times. I've dipped into little ones that um, seem to have topics that interested me. And then when I listened to your conversation with Jonathan Pajot, I thought, oh, we've really got to talk. But that was right at the beginning of the summer. And of course, the summer was crazy for me. So that never happened. And so I'm glad we're finally getting a chance to do this. Yeah, I am too. Uh, I know it's been a long time since people have asked me to interact with you too. So I, I know I could have reached out sooner <laughs> as well. It's the same kind of thing. I saw you know some of your videos, but I hadn't paid too much attention. But a lot of people have told me we had some similar uh, interests and similar areas of discussion. So uh, yeah, I'm really happy to be able to finally connect. Well, I, I thought, especially for this video, we'll just spend some time getting to know each other. I, I heard some of your story in the Peugeot video, and that really caught my interest because I am a, I'm a local church pastor. I'm not an academic. Yeah. And so for me, stories are basically, I mean, I think for academics, often it's books that they work on. And for me, it's pretty <laughs> sure. much stories. So let's, let's, let's begin. Um, and of course, after I've sort of gone through you, feel free to have at me and explore my story all you want. Um, who, who raised you and, and did you grow up in church? Yeah, sure. Well, we're going to start all the way back. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I guess I can start. I, I was I was born in New Jersey, raised in Western Massachusetts. Oh, um, wow. Where in New Jersey? Uh, Northern Jersey, Bloomfield. That's where oh, I was born. Okay. Yeah, I'm from are Patterson. you familiar? No, oh, you are. Okay. Okay. Yeah. My uh, my family history, if you want to go that far back, goes, <laughs> goes back into the 1600s in New Jersey on both sides of my family. So we uh, Interesting. have, uh, yeah, North Jersey is where pretty much all of my ancestors are, are from going way back. Okay. Um, but I was raised in Western Massachusetts. I currently live in Ithaca, New York. So generally kind of the Northeast that I pastored out in the Midwest for uh, six years. I was in Iowa and then Illinois. Um, I was raised in a Christian home, baptized in a Presbyterian church. And uh, which, that which was pres which Presbyterian brand? Yeah, well, this this congregation uh, was actually a it was a piece of USA church that okay. left not long after that. Um, okay. So a very kind of more confessional uh, piece of USA church. Uh, what year were you born? Eighty seven. Oh wow, you're young. Uh, yeah, yeah, I know. I am. <laughs> I've got kids that are not much, not much younger than you. <laughs> See, I appreciate I appreciate hearing that because I do a lot of work with college students, and uh, they make me feel old. So, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Keep going. I will interrupt. Oh, no, I'm you're... from New Jersey. Uh, oh, hey, I'm used to that, so that's totally fine with me. Uh, uh, I. So my in, my parents were new Christians when I was when I was born. Uh, they they became Christians, you know, in and just after college, and then got married. And um, so I was then uh, I was raised in Western Massachusetts. My parents were part of a Presbyterian church plant. There it was an evangelical EPC Evangelical Presbyterian Church. Um, so I, I I was very involved in the church certainly my whole life. Um, my my dad was an elder. At the church, you know, we always had Bible studies at our home. Uh, I attended a Christian high school. So it's very much in a Christian environment in some ways. In other ways, I lived in the most secular uh, county in the entire nation. So uh, not not very much Christian environment outside of outside of those those circles uh, that, that I was in. Um, I went to uh, Geneva College where I was yeah. studying to be a, a pastor in the PCA was really where I was heading at the time. Um, the EPC was having a debate on the women in ministry issue, um, which because of the position that, that I held on that issue, um, I, I didn't really want to pursue uh, the, the EPC. So I was looking into the PCA. Anyway, while I was there, there are a number and we could delve into some of this, but there are a number of issues that I was really thinking through um, about the continuity of the church, uh, the specifically looking at the church fathers and the thinking about issues of the sacraments eventually led me into exploring the Lutheran tradition. So then I, I decided to pursue ministry within the Lutheran church. Um, so after college, I got married, uh, pursued a master's degree in uh, theology. And it was after that, that I decided to pursue an MDiv. 
uh, was ordained, took my first call to a church in Iowa, uh, and then in Illinois, finished my PhD, uh, and then came to Ithaca, New York to do some chaplaincy work at uh, Cornell University. And I was doing that full time until COVID hit, campus shut down, and campus ministry became rather difficult. So I, I'm still connected, you know, to to the campus, and there's still a bit that I that I do there. But right now, um, I uh, I do a lot. I juggle a lot of things. But my my primary, I have two really primary callings at this point. Uh, one of those is uh, running Justin Center, which is my the it's a the organization that I run. We have the the podcast, the weekly uh, podcast, which is also on YouTube. But we also have a publishing house and uh, do some seminars and a number of other things as well. So I do that. And then I also work for uh, the American Lutheran Theological Seminary. Um, and I teach doctrine courses. So that's uh, that's that's what I do mostly. I still am doing some campus ministry as well. And uh, I'm preaching semi-regularly at various churches in the area. Okay, okay. Well, let's, 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 let's dive into some of this. You've got a lot of interesting tidbits here. So my, I grew up in New Jersey, but my mother is from and currently lives in Whitensville, Massachusetts, which is on the other oh. side of the state. And so, yeah, I, yeah. Where, where is that exactly? What's that near? It's, um, it's about, it's about 45 minutes north of Providence. It's oh, near okay. Worcester. So oh, yeah, it's sure. not, it's not too far. Yeah. No, um, nobody knows, nobody knows Western Mass. When I say no, that, nobody no, knows that no. part of the state at all. No, yeah, you know, not, not, Worcester is about as west as people go, and then you know nothing exists <laughs> past that. We're just in New York. <laughs> um, let's. So you were interested. You went to Geneva College. It's not a. It's not an unusual choice for people from Massachusetts. I've. Um, um, so now you were studying to be a pastor in the PCA. And, um, you know, of course, Tim Keller in many ways is one of the, um, one of the leading, well, well, had you, what, what attracted you to the PCA? Was it, I mean, there, so the PCA is an interesting church because on one yeah. hand, they're deeply conservative, but on the other hand, a la Keller, Westminster East, and really my father was involved in this because my father was a planted a church in Patterson, New Jersey and an African-American oh, okay. community. Okay, and um, and so growing up, I, I was very much part of sort of this conservative, reformed urban ministries movement. Mm -hmm. Out of which, of course, Keller came. And so, when I first discovered Tim Keller, he was by no means an unusual thing for me because I had seen a lot of Harvey Kahn, uh, Roger Greenway, who's from the Christian Reformed Church, taught at Westminster East for a while. Sure. And then when Calvin needed a new uh, missiology prof, brought him back to Calvin. Um, um, Roger's son, Scott, was a classmate of mine in college and seminary. So the CRC is a very close-knit denomination, almost an extended family. And um, Sure. And Scott and Roger actually, um, Roger's father was a CRC minister. And the CRC has a lot of these intergenerational ministerial families, of which I am also one. So there's a lot of those kind of links. So uh, what what attracted you to the PCA initially? Yeah, I, I don't know that it was it, it was particularly something about urban ministry. I don't know that that was really my concern, um, though, though I will say that it was kind of always my desire to do some kind of ministry in um, very unchurched areas in the Northeast. Uh, and, I, and I think, you know, Keller is probably a good example of somebody who really has been able to reach into that culture. Uh, and some of that is just knowing that it's a culture that's really difficult, particularly kind of the, I don't know, Ivy League kind of Northeastern culture that, that's yeah. very difficult to reach and very hostile to the faith. But it's a culture that I know very well, uh, which is why ending up at, you know, doing ministry in an Ivy League campus just kind of really fit with what I felt like my my calling kind of was. So, um, so maybe part of it, it, it was that, uh, but largely I think it was just theological. Um, coming from the EPC, uh, I, I just didn't feel like they were strict enough with their adherence to the confessions, um, you know, the, the Westminster Confession. Um, and, you know, I looked into other Presbyterian churches at the time and the uh, the RPCNA, which is what Geneva is, uh, I mean, they, they're exclusive psalmists. You know, they don't sing anything but psalms. They sing them a cappella, no instrumentation. Uh, and while I think the services were really beautiful, I mean, if you hear these, you know, four-part harmonies and, you know, singing the psalms, it's it's gorgeous. Uh, but 
I just wasn't convinced uh, scripturally that like there was some kind of necessity to like get rid of instrumentation stuff. So, uh, so I didn't want to pursue the RPCNA. So I guess kind of the only options for me within the Presbyterian world were, was pretty much the PCA and the OPC. Yeah. yeah. Um, and the OPC for me, I think I, I didn't see doing as, and I don't want to insult the OPC by any means by saying this, but that's going to come across that way. <laughs> I didn't see them doing as great of a job in terms of outreach. Like I felt like the, the PCA churches that I knew were far more kind of outreach oriented, yeah. which really was, was largely my passion as well. Yeah. Um, so that, that was what attracted me to the PCA. Keller, so I went into a deep dive uh, into Tim Keller starting in 2006 and really between 2006 and 2010, I listened to a ton of Keller. Um, and and one of the things that struck me very quickly about Keller was not just his um, love of, well, he's sort of a neo-Puritan, his love for the Reformed tradition. Keller also gave a lot of attention to, you know, the Dutch Calvinists, the Heidelberg Catechism, uh, yeah. Belgic, um, Belgic Confession, um, Kuiper, Bavink, some of some of these lights. Of course, this is the, the tradition I come out of. But right. Keller also gave a lot of attention to Luther, which was very interesting in yes. his work. And so with your story, it's interesting to me that you started um, – studying to be a pastor in the PCA. And then you had this movement into the Lutheran tradition. And so I'd, I'd really love to hear not just the, not just the logic behind that, but much more the story behind that in sure. terms of how that happened in your life. Yeah. Well, Keller was raised in a Lutheran church I and mean, he was right. raised in a Lutheran church, Missouri Synod. So you, I think you see a lot of that theology even coming through in his preaching. Um, you certainly see a lot of that kind of law gospel distinction emphasis that's it's uniquely kind of Lutheran emphasis that we have. Um, I think some of the, the Reformed voices, I'll say, that I was really attracted to the most, um, R.C. Sproul, uh, I mean, kind of R.C. Sproul is the go-to, I know, for a lot of people. Um, but I, my, I, I lived with like, you know, five other guys in this apartment. They were We were all theology majors, and we'd you know, it's like you think of guys in college, like staying up late to party. We're staying, staying up late watching R.C. Sproul lectures till like 2 a.m. Uh, but <laughs> so I, I loved this. And I mean, finding I loved girls those. that want to do that, too. <laughs> oh, so, somehow, somehow we all we all found women. So <laughs> uh, but uh, Sproul was, uh, I think, a very Luther influenced reformed guy as well. I mean, he cited Luther all the time. Uh, and, and I think what particularly gripped me in, in Sproul was his, in his book, The Holiness of God, and in his lectures, he's got a chapter called The Insanity of Luther, talking about Luther's recognition of God's holiness. And, and that always kind of stuck with me, uh, that, that just Luther's story. And not that I was unfamiliar with Luther's story before that. Um, but I'll say, and Michael Horton was another individual that I was really influenced by, I think, theologically, who, again, is very kind of Lutheran adjacent, you might say. Um, so a lot of the reformed people that I had really spent a lot of my time reading and listening to um, were very reliant on Luther's writings, which just is the reason why I started delving into the writings of Luther. Um, and, and some of that I could say is is some of my uh, own kind of existential angst uh, fit well with Luther's story as well. Uh, I, I think reading Luther and, and myself just struggling with questions of assurance. Um, questions of, do I stand under God's wrath? <laughs> do I know that my faith is real? Uh, how do I know that God's promise is really for me? Those kinds of questions that Luther wrestled with uh, very profoundly, I think just resonated with my own experience. So, so that's initially why I think I was drawn. I was drawn to Luther. Um, if you want the kind of story end of things, you know, the theologically, you know, the question of course is what was Luther right? <laughs> which, which I ended up coming to the conclusion that, that I think he was. Um, but those are some of the things that, that I think drew me to him in the first place. It, it, something else was just, I always had an interest in the church fathers. Uh, a, a lot of my, you know, fellow theology majors in college were, they were always reading the Puritans, you know, they're always drawn to like John Owen or, or, or like an American Puritan, like Jonathan Edwards, or for whatever reason, I just, I just did not, I was never gripped by their writings in the same way that a lot of people were. Uh, I liked Calvin quite a bit, but I don't think, for whatever reason, the Puritans just never resonated with me. 
And and especially as a guy who grew up in Western Massachusetts, I mean, I grew up like right down the road from Jonathan Edwards. Like I felt like I should love Jonathan Edwards. And I like tried to force myself to love Jonathan Edwards and I just couldn't. Um, so, but I was always drawn to the church fathers. You know, I, I just like, if I was going to, you know, all of my papers in college, you know, whether it was like a, say an Old Testament class, you know, we took a class on Daniel and you have like a final capstone paper, uh, you know, I'm going to write John Chrysostom's interpretation of the visions in Daniel. That's just was where I, I, I went for whatever reason. So it, it was really a mix of, of Luther and then reading the church fathers that, that got me to reexamine some of my, um, my views on, on worship, on the sacraments and some other things. So that's really what, what led me into Lutheranism. Okay. Okay. So you went to, um, let's see, I'm just following your master's. Where'd you get your master's? Yeah, I went to a school that is no longer in existence, <laughs> but uh, it was a school called the, uh, the Wittenberg Institute, oh, uh, which okay. was based in, in uh, Everett, Washington. Uh, and I, I wrote a thesis on the, uh, the new perspective on Paul, um, which it, it was really dealing with the question of uh, how the church fathers read Paul. Uh, and did the church fathers understand Paul in a way that the new perspective authors understand Paul? Or did they understand Paul in a way that's maybe more similar to what Luther said? Uh, and and, and my, the answer can, is? Uh, they're unanimously agree with luther on everything no i <laughs> uh, my my uh my conclusion was that in in many ways uh the the earliest i'm looking at the apostolic fathers in that in that thesis because it was a thesis it wasn't super long uh and i certainly could have gotten a lot more in depth but um my my argument was that they were far more like luther than they did respect on paul not not in every point and not every figure uh, but when it comes to certain questions like how do we interpret works of the law uh, are works of the law just say you know jewish boundary markers that's kind of more i guess james dunn's phraseology but um or are works of the law that what we are justified apart from are those something more general works in, in general and, and my argument is that they really see it at works in general um as as a proper interpretation of works of the law now you know, I could talk a long time about this, but uh, as you get into like origin, I think origin does kind of take more of the boundary marker view, but I'm saying that the earliest figures that we have don't seem to take that approach. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and really what I was trying to, to counter is the narrative that says that Luther's reading of Paul is solely due to his late medieval context. Mm -hmm. And, and so the, the argument isn't, you know, I don't think you have to prove that everyone agreed with Luther. But the point is, these are themes of Paul that people have seen all along, right? Yeah, you go back to yeah. the beginning of the show, other people saw these in Paul too. So, yeah. so it's more, and of course, everybody's context shapes how they view text, but yeah. it, there's more to it than just, than just saying, well, it's just his, you know, kind of late medieval legalism and nobody ever would have come up with these interpretations otherwise. Yeah. That sounds about right to me. Um, so master's, master's in theology, MDiv, why, why the MDiv? I mean, did you, I mean, were you, were you thinking of not going, you're just keeping your options open? Well, yeah, um, I, so I had, I'd always vacillated between uh, pastoral ministry and academics. And I think at numerous points in my career in, like in college, uh, I had bounced back and forth, like, do I want to be a pastor? Or do I want to, and I always knew I wanted to pursue a PhD at, at some point, but um, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. So at that point, I was really thinking about going right into a PhD program. Um, and so right after I, you know, when I was doing that, I was, I was uh, accepted into a PhD program in London. And, um, and I was also, but then I was looking, I was talking to Cambridge as well about the possibility of going there. And it was like, I'm going to go right into, you know, some kind of PhD program. And um, at the time I had moved, my wife and I had moved back to Massachusetts uh, as I was, I was finishing up writing my thesis uh, for, for this program. And uh, my pastor at home at the Lutheran church in my hometown just kept encouraging me to think about pastoral ministry. And I kept saying no. And eventually I said, okay, well, he offered me an internship at the church. And I said, okay, I'll, I'll do that. And, and really fell in love with preaching and, and everything else that goes into pastoral ministry. So, uh, so at that point, um, I, I found a, an online MDiv program to kind of finish out those practical theology you know, courses that obviously I didn't have with a, you know, a, a theological masters that wasn't geared toward that yeah. um so i did that uh while while i was there doing an internship at the church and then um 
I came into the uh, AALC, which is my Lutheran church body, the okay. uh, American Association of Lutheran Churches. We're, we're really tiny. Nobody's ever heard of us, but um, but but we've got like uh, about, you know, just under 70 congregations in the U.S. So we're, we're pretty small. Um, uh, but then, yeah, that, that's that's where I ended up. So I ended up taking a call to Iowa uh, and then I did end up pursuing my as a full time pastor. I'm like, well, I've got to do a Ph.D. that I could do from a distance. So I started looking into what my options were and um, I ended up doing a degree through the uh, South African Theological Seminary. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, they uh, it, I, I think it was a very good good program I mean, you know fully accredited program and everything like that but uh it it was uh i worked with the only lutheran guy that was on staff so they had one lutheran guy there that was very familiar with kind of contemporary lutheran debates and uh he was my advisor and uh and i completed that i don't when did i complete that it was a few three years ago now something like that okay well talk to me about campus ministry at cornell so one of one of the things you know as a pastor i've I, as a pastor, I'm just sort of a natural sheep herder, and that's become kind of a hallmark of my channel. We have a group of people, and one of one of one of the most interesting sheep in this little flock is a biblical universalist who, um, <laughs> I, I'm sorry, biblical Unitarian. He's going to kill me for that. Um, biblical Unitarian oh, <laughs> who um, who studied at Cornell, and so when you mentioned Cornell, I know his his ears are going to perk up at this, and he's going to be interested. He'll probably invite you on his channel because he does have a very interesting YouTube channel. But t- tell me about um, what what did you learn as a as a campus chaplain at Cornell? That sounds yeah, like a very I, I actually space. do. I, I've received emails from him. Uh, oh, so I know okay, who good. he is, yes. Uh, and, He's safe. Uh, he, he is safe. You can talk okay. about it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, that's good to know. I'm, I'm a little like wary of, well, Unitarians, you know, I <laughs> me, me think Unitarians in Ithaca, it's a, not, it's a little bit of a hostile uh, conversation <laughs> most of the time. Oh, boy. Uh, so, yeah, what do I say about campus ministry at Cornell? Um, it's, so I've been doing, this is my fifth year, I guess, fifth school year being involved in campus ministry. And during COVID, it, you know, again, it was right. really, it was really hard. We, I still kept connections with, with some students and uh, we couldn't do any Bible studies or any meetings on campus at that point because, you know, we weren't allowed there. So, um, but we did have some at, at our church and students weren't even allowed to like really be in any large groups or anything. So the restrictions were, uh, were pretty tough, but yeah, uh, campus ministry, um, my my wife my wife and I have both been very involved, uh, and she was doing campus ministry as well with with uh, female students, and she hosted Bible studies uh, as well. So both of us, and she's from Connecticut, so uh, uh, and right lived right near New Haven, so right near Yale, very same kind of culture uh, that I think both of us were were raised in. So this this fits I think very well. Um, I'll say being at at I, I think being in the Midwest for a while was a uh, it was very good for me to be stretched culturally, to get to know another culture. Uh, and I, I learned to appreciate it a lot. I think there's a lot of things about Midwestern culture that are a heck of a lot better than Northeastern culture. Uh, I mean, in terms of how we view family and prioritize work over all, you know, things in the Northeast and, and those kind of things. Uh, but when, I think when I came back to Cornell and I met some of the students, it, it was very much, um, I felt this is like home. Like this is, this is the calling that God's given me is to do this to be with these kind of, of people. Um, and yeah, so I, I did, uh, you know, a lot of Bible studies. I still do a Bible study. We're actually doing one this evening on campus, um, with, with some students. Uh, I, you know, my ministry was largely toward, toward men on campus. And, you know, I know a lot of our kind of overlapping interests are, are regarding Jordan Peterson's work. Uh, and my interest in his work really comes from, the men that I encounter on campus ministry more than anything else. So I followed his work, you know, some uh, otherwise, even before that. But really, when I started seeing the impact that he had on young men in college ministry, I mean, everybody just talked about him all the time. It was like all all of the men just brought up Jordan Peterson, brought up, you know, Ben Shapiro as well, seemed to be a big topic of of discussion. So it was like, I've really got to get to know these guys better, better, because these are, they're having this huge impact on, on these, these young men. Um, you know, I know a guy now who's in, um, you know, who's currently in seminary and, uh, he said it was really listening to Peterson's lectures on the Bible that got him to recognize that you can, 
be intellectual and take the Bible seriously. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You know, so um, so that that was really kind of my interest there was that that led me to just kind of seeing the fruit of that work uh, and seeing it, I think, in a very, a very positive way. So so a lot of my ministry has really been in the area of kind of trying to equip young men, encourage young men, um, encouraging them to stay strong in their faith, uh, really encouraging them that you can be you can have an intellectually robust faith. Uh, you, you can have a faith not not that answers every question because it's not supposed to, <laughs> but, but what, which can really be uh, defended intellectually. What got you into YouTube? Ooh, what got me into YouTube? Um, hmm. What did get me into YouTube? What was the first uh, video you made? The first video I made, For you didn't YouTube. go back. You didn't go back on my channel. Did you? No, I didn't. Okay. <laughs> now I will. <laughs> And yeah, everybody yeah. who watches this will. Yeah, yeah, right. Well, if you're a really, bunch if you, of people with internet skills. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, if you want to, if you go back to the beginning of my channel, I started my channel having nothing to do with theology at all. Uh, I my my channel started because I was a, I was really involved in in like professional yo-yoing when I was younger. <laughs> Yes. So I competed at the world contest and all sorts of things back then. And uh, so I started a YouTube channel to host a bunch of old videos of me uh, yo-yoing. So I am going to definitely look for this. <laughs> this is I, I am. I am sorry, but uh, you are going to be memed. You, it is going to happen. So brace yourself. Oh, no, it's it's good. I actually I, I've recorded some some new ones, too. I still do it. Some, so wow. uh, but they're, not, they're not. I have another channel for them now. So <laughs> I, but it was I was young. I was like, uh, you know, I was I competed at Worlds back in 2001. Um, yeah. So it was quite a while. Well, the ministry thing doesn't work out. You got something to fall back on. It's true. I'm not sure how, how much financially you can really uh, get out of yo-yoing, but I don't know. People are doing it with World of Warcraft and how many games, you know, why not the yo-yo? I know. Why not? <laughs> what the heck? I, I think it's way more interesting than video games. Uh, so, so that's how I, start, how I started it. Uh, and then I actually recorded some videos I remember recording a couple of videos in college that were like defending Calvinism, which I was at the time. Uh, I deleted those a long time ago and they don't exist anywhere. Oh, so I don't, I don't think you'll have any luck. I'm sorry. Bad. I know. I know. <laughs> sorry. Uh, if you're going to be on YouTube and especially if you're a Lutheran, you should keep your sins up there just so yeah, people yeah, can right. go back and find them. And that's, I, I do that's actually have, bold. I did actually keep up some of my old blog posts defending Calvinism. Okay. So you can still find those. Uh, I, I so I had a blog that was called Justin Center that I started in college, and this this blog was really a place for me to just write my thoughts. It wasn't really meant to be like, you know, everybody read this thing publicly. It was like I, I was just kind of processing my own theological thoughts, and I needed an outlet to to write it down. Um, and and so that during my transition to Lutheranism, I started writing things on there about why I was thinking through things and. Uh, and, and then the blog actually kind of, it, for whatever reason, it got very popular. Uh, and, and I was not really ready for that at the time. I wasn't trying to give myself a you know big public face or something. I was too, I really, I wasn't prepared for it at all. Yeah. Um, I, I was, again, very, very young and I was in college still. So uh, and I'm not a, a, usually not a big proponent of people in college kind of getting a public platform. I think you got to get a little bit of a uh, Make sure you're ready for it, you know, before you, yeah. you jump into it, yeah. especially because you can't escape things that you say, yeah. uh, unless you delete them before they get popular, which I did with those Calvinism videos. So. <laughs> um, <laughs> but but it ended up getting like pretty, pretty big. Uh, and so the blog is really what I used for a long time to communicate. And those things were shared around. Eventually, I was asked to be on Atheos, which was um, I, I don't think it's used that and people don't really blog much anymore i kind of gave up on blogging a while ago yeah. but um but then from there i basically decided that i was going to kind of just follow what people were doing it was like well one another platform gets big and that's where everybody goes that's what i'm going to do so um and i think when you have a kind of public presence you just have to do that you have to be willing to change so uh podcasting was the next thing i started doing and I had a couple of YouTube videos, but I wasn't really focused on YouTube. Uh, and then 
it was really only maybe four years ago that I really started focusing on YouTube uh, because it seemed like that's just where everybody went. Um, it was like everybody went to podcast and everybody started going to YouTube and I still do it as a podcast, but I do, you know, both. So, yeah, yeah. Um, so it's really just kind of, I guess, following trends. Uh, I, I did, I did make a, a TikTok, and I think I made two short videos on there and then realized I, I can't follow every trend. I'm not, I'm not, <laughs> just, <laughs> I, I can't. <laughs> TikTok isn't really given for theological treatise. No. <laughs> no, it's just like, it's not a good platform for sharing. I mean, of course, I waste all this time on Twitter, which also is a great platform for sharing complex ideas, but I do it no, anyway. No, but you can, you can have fun on Twitter. Twitter, Twitter should so. be fun. It really it should. should be. It should be. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so tell me about this. How did this organization start and why did it start and what do you want from it? Yeah. So the reason I think why, well, the reason why it started was because again, I started a blog and it became a podcast and, uh, and, and then we, st I started a publishing house really for one reason was there was a, a book called the way of salvation in a Lutheran church by a guy named George Henry Gerberding, uh, that I was gifted by a retiring Lutheran pastor. And I loved this book and I thought it was a great summary of Lutheranism, very like easy to read, concise, wonderful little book. And I started recommending it to people. Uh, and people were like, I can't find this book anywhere because it's not in print. And, you, you know, you could buy these like very expensive old used copies. So I was like, well, I wonder if there's a way to get this back in print. So at the time uh, I found, you know, I think print on demand stuff was pretty new at the time. And I was like, well, that's a way that I could, you know, get this out and don't have to like have this giant, you know, uh, storage space of books and send them out for my home or something so uh, it was create space that i had used at the time so i just really wanted to get out a book and by the time i had finished it i realized that there were a few other books that i really wanted to get out so that hadn't been printed for many years so that's how the publishing started it was basically I, there are these really great old lutheran texts um they haven't been published in many years and i wanted to put them in more of a, a you know newer typeface um with the first book, we really updated the language as well to make it you know, like a modernized version um, with some footnotes and things, historical footnotes and stuff throughout the text. So we started, I started the publishing house from there. So now I had a blog, a podcast, a publishing house, and it was kind of becoming a, becoming an, an organization uh, just just kind of by, by nature. So- uh, Is this like a Lutheran gospel coalition? Well, <laughs> It's mostly me at this point. We have some other guys involved. Uh, so it's not big enough to be that uh, by but, any but means. It's, it's, but it very much has that vibe listening to you because that's very yeah. much sort of the neo-Puritan gospel coalition, young, restless, yes. and reformed. You know, as sitting in a Christian reform seat watching these people go, it's like, uh, yeah. oh, well, and, and that's why a lot of people in the CRC look at them and say, oh, they're they're Puritans. They're not yes. they're not like us. They're cousins. Yes. But... Yes. Yeah. Well, I, I can't say that those kinds of organizations were not an influence on what I was doing. Uh, I, I think probably Ligonier would be the most. OK, yeah. Uh, the one that I would probably line up with the most. Like, I think Ligonier was really more the inspiration than anything else. Um, I mean, Gospel Coalition kind of similar in some ways, yeah. but it was thinking through the fact that when I was looking into Lutheran theology, like there was nothing, there were no like podcast. There was like one podcast uh, that I listened to and that was kind of it. There was no online presence and the reformed were, you know, especially the, and I was part of that whole young restless reformed. I was the right age for that whole yep. thing. Yep. Uh, and they were really good at marketing and really yep. good at getting the word out. And like Lutheran just did, did do that. So when I tried to create those resources, uh, what I have often thought through especially when I was beginning was what are the resources that I wish existed when I was looking into these things? So I, I try to use that mindset to create resources for other people. So, so where are the videos of you squaring off with all the young restless and reformed guys? I mean, this, this sounds to me like a YouTube phenomenon waiting to happen. Um <laughs> I mean, yeah. that, that, that would be that would be awesome. I'd love to because you know you're right. There is a sense in which, so my um, my wife uh, grew up Lutheran. She um, her okay. father was a 
her father was a Lutheran missionary in okay. in Nigeria. And then he got malaria so bad he had to move back to the States. Mm. And so he uh he died in a car accident before his death. Mm. He um he was he was pastoring a small Lutheran church in eastern Michigan. And but but he married a woman who was um really a um a fundamentalist Baptist. And so my mm. poor wife went to Lutheran church in the morning and Baptist church at night. And um, so that'll, that'll, that'll kind of, that's confusing. That'll, that'll be a little confusing for someone, but yeah. you know, there are obviously many Lutherans around. Um, Walter Wangren was a big influence on my pastor in college, Dave mm. Beelan. And so he, he'd do a lot of Walter Wangren stuff, but you don't, you know, the, the young restless and reform movement really catapulted Puritan theology into the American consciousness again right. and into the American Christian ecosystem again. And and it's it does seem like um the Lutherans, with the possible exception of Nadia Pulse Weber, um oh, the boy. well that's yeah. Yeah, I, that's well this story. is just, this is well, but this is you know, because yeah. of course the reformed have their spectrum too, obviously. Yeah, yeah. But the um, but but it is interesting that in many ways, there, the Lutheran Church in America is in need of a a repristination, a a, yeah. a going back to its source, a um, and, and it sounds like that's that's really sort of where you fit in. That's very yeah, that's very much what I'm trying to do. Um, I I have done quite a few conversations with Calvinists. I've had some dialogues, debates. Uh, that that do exist out there. I'll, I'll tell you this though: when I have tried to do some <laughs> debates with Calvinists, more popular ones, um, the responses have have often been, "But I don't really know what you guys think." And uh, it, I, I think the especially when it comes to issues of like baptism, because baptism tends to be the place people go where we're very different than the Reformed uh, because of our sacramentalism. So I. Yeah, I've had a lot of, of requests for, you know, dialogues or debates kind of turned down because people say, like, I, I don't know what you guys think, and I don't really want to look into it. <laughs> so um, I, I did do a debate uh, on the subject of, of limited atonement one time, and, and the guy that I was debating, you know, gave this opening statement that was a just long critique of Arminianism, which is not a Lutheran position. Right. And, you know, it, it really had no relevance to anything that I was saying. And I think it's just been a little bit of frustration with some of those discussions. Um, so so I try to do them more in a discussion format than a debate format, because when I've done debates, it's just almost always the reform guy defaults to you're a Calvinist or an Arminian, and I don't even know what to do with you, which doesn't end up being too productive. So I did some really good talks with a guy named Gavin Ortland, if you're familiar with him. Uh, okay. He's a He's a Baptist. He's Calvinistic. He's not, you know, he's a Baptist theologian. Yeah. Um, and we did some, some, I think, very good talks on baptism. Um, but yeah, in terms of what, what you bring up about uh, the kind of resourcement project, right? That that's really what I'm trying to do. Um, my my interests have gone, you know, beyond just the kind of narrow theological debates too, to a lot of our cultural issues as we're dealing with, obviously the. Kind of craziness in our culture right now and i think that there is a theological and philosophical answer that to a lot of these issues that can be founded within the classical tradition more generally um and, and you're seeing a lot of you know a lot of things from eastern orthodox guys from roman catholic guys about a lot of this stuff but you're not really seeing a lot of uh, i mean obviously you're a protestant that's involved in these conversations yeah, yeah. but so i don't mean that there's there's nobody but there aren't a lot i think i think that the the protestant intellectual tradition has a lot of really um rich and valuable insight that that can be had in these broader conversations but for whatever reason it seems like we're kind of left out um because i think i, I don't know if it's when people think about um protestant traditions they tend to think of maybe kind of um maybe a pop evangelicalism you know something that's maybe not as, as rooted uh, so my interest is really in a lot of the 17th century um, Lutheran thinkers who really bring about a lot of continuity with classical philosophy and classical thought uh, and incorporate, you know, Lutheran, uh, these these new 
and I wouldn't even say that they're new, because I'd say that the Lutheran ideas are present in the earlier church as well. Um, and, and I'd say they're, they're drawing on themes that are there in the, in the historic church. Um, so, so my interest is largely in um, the era of theology that is kind of pre-modernity, but post-Reformation, and, and trying to say that a lot of these ideas and, and theological themes or doctrines that we find in those times uh, can be very much applicable to a lot of the, the conversations culturally that we're having right now. That's super interesting, number one, because I'd be hard-pressed to, off the top of my head, head mention a 17th century Lutheran thinker. Exactly. But al- <laughs> yeah, but, but also because from, you know, from, let's say, a, a Christian reform perspective, the young, restless, and reformed movement was very much a fixation on 17th century reformed thinking rather than, let's say, on 16th century reformed thinking. Mm. And the a lot of the critiques, I mean, the part of the, I mean, it's interesting you mentioned baptism, which is sort of this this dirty little fracture that goes beneath the young restless and reformed movement because many yeah. of the many of the the um the people whose names are are well known in that movement are reformed baptists but yes. then you of course you've got the pca and so the question of the question of of infant baptism is something obviously that that sort of runs through runs underneath that fissures underneath that conversation and and it it is interesting to me just thinking historically why why the 17th century is is so important in let's say the the questions of our time part of my thesis in in looking at what's happening now in the church and understanding why jordan peterson set off what he did Mm -hmm. is because in many ways a lot of modernity is spent and we're watching its unraveling and that of course is allowing other older traditions to re-emerge yes while at the same time questions are being things things that had been settled by modernity are once again unsettled But Mm -hmm. now also we've got, so the other half of the, a lot of the stuff I do is talk to, you know, John Verveke, who, you know, it would be interesting for for you to interact with. He's gotten more and more in demand as a result of all the work that we've been doing. So it's harder harder to get on the schedule. We were emailing back and forth, but I hadn't heard from him in a while. I I still would really like that to happen. Yeah. So, So on one hand, you have this recession of modernity as it sort of unravels, yeah. letting a lot of the pre-modern stuff now back onto the table while at the same time you've got all of the fruits of modernity which have come you know not um not the least of which is of course come through scientific means that also are on the table and so we're, we're living in a very interesting time when there's just a lot of stuff on the table that people are sort of moving around and and of course if anybody's a sort of an inquisitive you know, explorer, that would be Jordan Peterson, who's yeah, pulling yeah. up all of this stuff and throwing it on the table in a very interesting way. And suddenly everyone is saying, oh, 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 mm-hmm. and and off we go. Sure. So, so what, so, so, so give me a little cursory, uh, so, so explain a little bit to me who these 17th century Lutheran thinkers are and what, what they were grappling with. Yeah, sure. So I, I really, I'm going to cite one figure above all of the others because I think he's the best theologian our tradition has produced, uh, and that is Johann Gerhard. Um, so Johann Gerhard um, is what what I think I think of Gerhard as really pulling together the best of of Luther and the best of Aquinas and synth- and synthesizing them. Huh. Uh, because uh, Gerhard is very much a he's a scholastic theologian in a lot of ways so he's using those classical philosophical categories um, I, I would argue uh, that I think he's more careful than than Thomas is in some of his appropriation of Aristotle um, he's not as eager to just appropriate so broadly not that Aquinas isn't critical 
in his appropriation because I think he is more than he's given credit for sometimes, especially by some some Dutch Reformed philosophers. No offense to the Dutch Reformed, uh, but but oftentimes in that in that context, I've seen Aquinas is kind of the go to bad guy in yeah. some ways. Um, but Gerhard also has the Luther spirit of reform, uh, the the centrality of the pastoral concerns. Uh, particularly the centrality of the pastoral concerns of you know the salvation of sinners, uh, sinners being uh, burdened by by sin and their consciences. Um, you know, Gerhard is also very, I think, balanced in his in his moral writings as well. You know, as opposed to the kind of caricature you get of Lutheranism that we just uh, this we have this idea of like cheap grace or something that you know live however you want. <laughs> uh, you know, Gerhard has these uh, this multi volume set on Christian piety uh, that that I think is a really brilliant. Um, a piece of piece of writing. Uh, so he's also a, a devotional writer, very indebted to the the medieval mystical tradition as well, um, but appropriating it in a more a Protestant context. So what what I see in Gerhard, I guess, is is kind of the, the strain of th three different kind of strains of of Christianity kind of culminating, uh, and that is the you know the Reformation emphasis on justification by grace. Uh, and the distinction between law and gospel and the centrality of scripture. Then we have the the medieval mystical tradition and the emphasis on on union with God uh, and piety and prayer. But then also the scholastic, more intellectually robust uh, tradition that is very careful to defend the faith, give a, a philosophical kind of rigor to uh, what's being what's being argued. So I see a lot of Gerhard's. Uh, writings and and the way that he does theology is very valuable for the church especially today um there's a there's a phrase that's a lutheran american lutheran theologian uh, named charles Krauth, who's a 19th century writer he uses the phrase the conservative reformation to to talk about the the lutheran reformation in particular and by conservative reformation Krauth says the lutheran reformation was really you know it's it's not radical it's not revolution it, it is an attempt to preserve the past and to preserve tradition, but do so in a way that is also critical. And, and that kind of mode is what I think is needed in our world today, is, is to recapture tradition, uh, which is, is why a lot of people are jumping to Rome and Eastern Orthodoxy right now. And, and I think I get it <laughs> because I have some of the same sympathies. Um, but, but I think when you get to you know the Lutheran tradition, and the Anglican tradition is probably very, very close in a lot of ways as well, is to say that no, we are part of this great Christian tradition, but it's not that we just grab the past uncritically. We, we can reform, uh, we can change, but do so in a way that is that is still consistent within our traditions. Um, so that's what I what I would really like to see, I think, in the church and in the world today is that recapturing of the past, but not a recapturing of the past that is, I would say, maybe kind of naive. Um, you know, I've seen from some some, especially very young guys who, you know, say convert to Roman Catholicism that have this idealized view of, say, the 13th century, <laughs> like everything in the world can just go back to the way it was here. And, uh, you know, I, I just don't think that's realistic. And, and I think we have to be honest with our changing world. So so I'm not a I, I'm interested in resourcement and, and going back to our to some of these ideological roots, especially to talk about the Christian West and even going back further into the, the ancient Greeks. But I don't think we can do that without without thinking about how that affects our, our contemporary world and looking at our current challenges today, which are very different than what the world faced, say, in the 13th century. That's 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 excellent. That's excellent. That 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 I found that I just found that super helpful, and I can see. I, I like the framing of 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 the Lutheran tradition as a conservative Reformation in that sense, because the i mean the reformation it's popular now um oh was it brad gregory his his work yes. roman catholics yes. yep. um i read i recently read another roman catholic um on the you know the reformations um that that's sort of a popular thing looking back historically to note that it, it isn't just one thing that happened it's a it's a very it's a deeply multifaceted movement which Yes. obviously deeply impacted in many ways uh luther won because what he he did he did eventually manage to reform the roman catholic church thanks to in some ways a reactive 
uh, movement against him, but there was a ton of reformation that happened in the church because of the threat that the Protestant churches became to the to the Roman Catholic Church. So, um, yeah, but but even so, the, there was some positive appropriation of Reformation ideas among yep. at Trent and at Vatican II, probably even more clearly. Yep, yep, yep. So that that's that's super helpful, and and that's and you can also see because right now, obviously, in you know, I'm surrounded by a lot of people who have left their evangelical tradition and are yeah. seeking orthodoxy and pursuing the orthodox church um there are a couple of there are a couple of uh individuals who grew up christian reformed who are in the orthodox church yep. who who are some of them have you know are fairly high status so it's yeah we're 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 in a moment when there there definitely is a realization that the past has been too hastily dismissed Yes. And there is there are good reasons to to go back. But, you know, part of where I fit sort of between John Verveke, who's a, a non-theist cognitive scientist right. and Jonathan Peugeot, who went from evangelical back to orthodoxy, is Protestants in the middle are sort of like, yeah, you've got a point. We really do have to pay attention to the past. On the other hand. To what degree can we really go back, and to mm -hmm. what degree are even um, are even attempts to attempts to let's say reappropriate older traditions? You know, you you are bringing plenty of new things into the older tradition. You 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 can't really simply inhabit John Chrysostom in the 21st century in North America. There are going to be no, you can't. deep discontinuities there. And I, I don't think we need to be embarrassed by that, even though we certainly mm -hmm. need to be careful about the kind of siftings that we do. Yeah, I, but I think there's, you know, we talk about evangelicalism. I So I was just at the, the uh, Evangelical Theological Society meeting a couple weeks ago presenting, and, and I had a lot of conversations with guys there and listened to a lot of papers. And, and it's very clear that evangelicalism Many figures in evangelicalism are really trying to to recover a lot of the past. Um, they really are looking for continuity. And so there are a number of people right now who I think are trying to do the work of saying, we can remain Protestant, but also tie ourselves to the historic church. Like there's, you you don't, and I think we have this kind of either or right now. Um, and and I think maybe if I didn't discover Lutheranism, I very well could have gone Eastern Orthodox. Um I mean, I mean, to be blunt, I never would have joined Rome. I just, I've just never found the claims of the papacy compelling. Uh, but, but orthodoxy, there, there's a certain uh, aura about it. That, that's know, that that's, I think is that's for all my listeners here. That's Jordan B. Cooper. The YouTube <laughs> net channel is on his. You can leave the comments below. That's fine. But just what he said about there it is. And I know a few Catholics who will agree with what you just said as well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I have plenty of Catholic listeners. I love my Catholic brothers and sisters. I'm not. No offense, but I just, I, I just, I've never historically found those claims compelling. So yeah, yeah, that's on me. Yeah. You can blame me for that. Uh, so, uh, but, but I think that we really need to, to show that there is this robust Protestant tradition as well. And, and I encourage people as they're kind of thinking of jumping ship uh, from evangelicalism or, or wherever to their local non-denominational church to at least explore those classical Protestant traditions too. Uh, I just think it's important to, to, to not just you know, associate your local mega church with that's the Protestant tradition. <laughs> Just I mean, because, in some real sense, I I don't know that I would even consider that Protestant. I mean, I think it's kind of a whole new phenomena. Because when I think of Protestant, I think of a you know group of historic movements re really thinking about the Anglican, Reformed, and Lutheran traditions. Um, and, and and I usually use the term classical Protestant um, to really kind of define those traditions that I think have those historical roots. But when you're talking about you know the the local megachurch. It's just it's it's so far from those roots. The question is, can you really even give it that label? I, I don't know. That's 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 a really interesting statement. <laughs> and, and well, part of what part of what we're wrestling with, I think, is that there is so much in the water right now, and so much is available to us via printing, publishing, the internet, yep. and the human beings have a need to attempt to 
gather for themselves some sort of collection of the past and the now that the you know i often in conversations with people say that the protestant church is has become in some ways the experimental the um the experimental wing of the church uh, <laughs> people are experimenting yeah. with just about anything and everything and that's it's it's sort of the that that's what's happening right now yeah. and the i mean the mega church it's so it's so interesting because it's it's sort of easy to beat up on the mega church i had a really interesting conversation with um uh, james wellman who wrote high on god he's a post mainline really post christian professor of i don't even know what he's teaching up in university of washington but did a very interesting sociological study on mega churches and and from someone whose past was in sort of the declining main line it was it was a fascinating it, a lot of what he said was just even though politically he's very opposed to where a lot of mega churches are in terms of american politics he was just simply fascinated by the amount of deployment that a mainline perspective can admire of what a mega church can actually do on the ground and i was just this morning uh, beckett cook um who yeah i just started reading his book this morning his 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 uh, spiritual memoir and you know in in this and it's it's really interesting to sort of take cheap shots at mega churches, but when you listen to his conversion story, it's pure mega church, you know, mm, invited yeah, to yeah. A, a a mega church in Los Angeles in Southern California, and this first sermon just completely has a clear conversion experience in mm. the sermon, and his life goes in a radically different direction. So, the, the, yeah, the God, I, God is, you know, this is where I'm, I've, I don't, I don't, I'm. I don't think I'm really saying anything against Lutherans, but this is where sort of my Calvinism comes to the fore that God is wild and free and pretty much gets to do what he wants with people. And, yeah. and he does it all the time. <laughs> oh yeah. I don't mean to imply that God can't work through mega churches. <laughs> Just <laughs> uh, uh, the, uh, and I think that the church, the problem with mega church is that a lot of those studies in those churches have recognized themselves at this point is that sure. They, they bring people to, you know, a moment of conversion, but they don't really have discipleship uh, because there's not a lot of substance uh, in, in the preaching. And, and I know that they've tried to address that in various ways, but um, it, it they don't tend to be a place where a lot of people stay, uh, at least younger people who are really wrestling with a lot of the questions that we're facing right now. I, I don't think it gives them the rootedness that they really need to to address the problems that we're facing. So, well, that, that, that's kind of, you know, that, 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 that you, this, what we've done so far is really helpful in terms of sort of me being able to orient you in my mental map. And, <laughs> sure. um, and, and, and again, I have seen, um, a lot of your videos have sort of come up in the, in the yeah. feed and I've, you know, I, I must confess this probably hasn't helped your YouTube algorithm. I've often once watched, you know, three and five and eight minutes of them. And <laughs> and if anybody's ever bored and well, no, but but you know, part of for me, I I find I find Christian YouTube rather dull generally mm. because a lot of it is it's it's sort of it's sort of supporting it's sort of supporting people and where they're at. And I, you know, I've, I've, I've heard the, a lot of these things are map territory. So, but, but I'm much more interested now in terms of your project because yeah. now I can really see sort of how it, the, the niche that it fits in, because I never thought, sat down and thought before, yeah, where are, where are the Lutherans in terms of this, this, big wave that is happening the young restless right. and reform fit in um the you know sort of the 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 tr the trad catholics they fit in yeah. orthodoxy it fits in and we really haven't seen much from the lutherans and that's it seems to be that's sort of where you fit in yes okay yeah okay. i think so we're we're kind of our little little niche here <laughs> So we're we're an hour into this sucker and you know we can I mean we can stop and go it doesn't really matter and I'll give you a copy of this video I I usually just post my my 
my raw videos, there's no editing that I do because you know, for a variety of reasons. I don't know if you had anything you wanted to pursue um, or if you had any questions for me, if you want to go into my story or do any of that, that's fine too. It's up to you. Yeah, I don't know. Where where do we go from here? Uh, is there anything else that, that kind of thoughts you have or, or questions you have about things that I've done or maybe that you've seen or curious about? Well, it was, but why, you know, how you got, into you know how how you landed in the Jordan Peterson space, given the fact that you were doing campus ministry, I've heard many people who are doing yeah. campus ministry just wind up, you know, having to figure out who Jordan Peterson is because he's so important in that area. So, um, well, what I don't know any anything you'd like to say about Peterson and where have you have you taken a look at have you subscribed to Daily Wire Plus? Have you seen his biblical? Any of his new ones yet? I so I I uh, subscribed to Daily Wire Plus to watch the What Is a Woman documentary, and then I unsubscribed because I didn't want to pay. But now, but I do want to see those, so you know I may sign up again. <laughs> I, I am interested. In, I really am interested in watching them. So I don't know. I'm back and forth with my with my uh, subscription there. I uh, Matt Matt Walsh got upset with me about my comments about his What Is a Woman documentary. Though. Oh yeah, I, I, I heard he canceled you. Let's he tell canceled me. About me. That. Yeah, I. <laughs> I mean, I, you kind of look like him. I mean, yeah, your I know. beard's Maybe. a little, a little bright, a little lighter, but you know. it's a little longer. I think it was the jealousy of the. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, I and I pay, like I said, I pay attention to the Daily Wire stuff because I, especially because students like interact yeah. with that stuff a lot, and they have a huge impact. And you know, I, I don't agree with everything that everyone on there says, but I generally uh, I, I appreciate a lot of a lot of what they do and. Um, so my my feeling is that someone took uh, my feeling is some producer of Matt Walsh's show probably took like a little snippet of this review that I had that sounded negative and probably gave it to him and said respond to this because it wasn't the entirety if you watch the entire video it I said I liked the documentary. <laughs> like I, it was all positive things, and I said I'm glad they made the documentary. I do think it was generally it was generally helpful. Uh, and I know even at Cornell, they've actually had a a couple showings, private showings, because they don't want to uh, uh, make everybody uh, upset. <laughs> I guess uh, Ann Coulter was just on campus, and they like you know uh, ruined the event because they were screaming and whatever. But. Uh, um, so, so I've seen it, you know, have a, have an impact there. But I just made the point in this video that the fact that it is Matt Walsh and he's a very controversial figure means that there are certain people that it's not going to reach, right? There are certain people that I know, especially people in the church. There are people that I know that, that I would love to show that documentary to because I think they would really appreciate it. But because of some of the political yeah. things that they disagree with that have nothing to do with that issue, yeah. they're just kind of turned off from from watching it. And I said, it's kind of unfortunate that we're so tribalized in the way that we are that... You see, you're like, oh, that group made it, so I won't watch it. Um, but that's just kind of the nature of, of where we're at. So that was the reason he canceled me. Wow. Well, well, that's yeah. what's interesting about that is that's generally true of almost anything Daily Wire. Of course it is. <laughs> I, I, you know, I grew up in a black community, so you know, mm -hmm. you know, African Americans are a very interesting segment of the American voter because, mm -hmm. on one hand, they're they're reliable democratic voters but on the other hand they're also the most church going demographic yep. in america and and in many ways deeply conservative so yeah. it's you know and that sort of confuses a lot of white people who don't understand those dynamics yep but but you know it's interesting i know daily wire plus wants to sort of break out of the Ben Shapiro reputation. I mean, Ben Shapiro yeah. has built for himself a, a, a fine career on doing a certain shtick and, yes. and okay. And at once, okay, you're all, everybody knows you for that shtick. Now yes. you want to sort of do something else. You're going to sort of have to pay the price for getting famous yes. for the shtick. It's exactly. Just the way it is. And I, in fact, had, um, I I get that even even just the fact that I have a name for being associated with Jordan Peterson, um, yep. I get grief from 
people for that because well you shouldn't pay any attention to him oh okay um or you shouldn't you shouldn't say anything positive about him oh, okay and you know that, that just kind of goes on and on in our polarized in our oh polarized i get it con- yeah i know I, oh, I get it constantly every time i have responded to anything he said or, or mentioned anything that he said in, in a video if there's inevitably going to be a barrage of comments saying you shouldn't take this guy seriously you should yeah. dignify him by even talking about him. like which yeah obviously i think it's ridiculous but but it's it yeah. is it is a problem when um i haven't i i also subscribe i subscribe to daily wire plus I, and i i haven't been able to actually sit through all of what is a woman yet i've seen i've seen snippets of it um but it, it is it is it is a remarkably interesting <laughs> it yeah, is a yeah. remarkably interesting thing just just watching the straight face but then when some of these um some of these pundits themselves i don't know if they are thin skinned or not but at least when they get thin skinned on the internet it's like yeah uh, you know you're you complain about everybody else's victim you know victim you know embracing the victim mantle yep. uh, it's it's sort of unseemly for you to do it too that's exactly so. right you you have to be ready for the pushback yeah 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 if so. you're going to if you're going to push you got to get pushed back that's going to ha- that's going to happen inevitably now, now, someone, someone on on Twitter mentioned Christian nationalism, and you you also did a video about that recently. Oh yeah, that's and, been. And uh, for, go ahead. Have you followed that conversation in this last week? It's kind of blown up. I mean, it's been a conversation that's ongoing. But I I, I have just so. So I my undergraduate degree was in history, and George Marsden was one of my professors, and so oh sure. When I watched this. You know, when I watch even people from my alma mater who just sort of lose, you know, set their hair on fire over Christian nationalism, I, I'm like, what? You know, we just had Thanksgiving. Uh, pilgrims and Puritans, why did they come to this continent? I mean, it's it, to me, it's it's just an audacious thing to, and then I'll point out to people, well, why don't you go to Duke? university and look at that cathedral there in the middle of the campus and ask yourself how donald trump traveled through time and built that building or let's say the national cathedral in washington i mean christianity protestantism and the united states it's pretty much like this boys and girls and to me the yeah. the most the much more interesting story is the development since the counterculture of you know this is where i i'm very interested in tom holland's work where oh, yeah, you sort sure. of have this cloaking of this non-confessional uh, secularized christianity which then sort of gets weaponized against confessional um, historic institutions and Christianities. And, mm. and to me, that's the culture war. It's a Christendom civil war. It has been the oh, whole sure. time. So, but I don't, I don't know what, what kind of stuff. So, Cause so the, again, the history, it, there's a reason that the reformed, you can, you can find the reformed um, in places like Switzerland and the Netherlands and then the Americas, because these were the fringes of political power and unity in Europe, whereas, yeah. you know, Lutheranism in Europe had um, quite a bit more, you know, in the Scandinavian countries, right. of course, Kierkegaard <laughs> responds to that. So, so Lutheranism and its relationship with state power Mm-hmm. is a bit different from the history of let's say the reformed churches and their relationship to state power yeah it it very much is um and that relationship to state power has not always been good uh i would say sometimes it has and sometimes it hasn't i, I think that the the alignment of the church and the state in the way that you see say in germany immediately post-reformation i think works pretty well um, the the prince is generally viewed as the kind of guardian of the faith in some way, and you would see still that language. You know, the British monarchy, for example, which obviously was Lutheran, but um, but there are some, I think, some, some pretty significant parallels actually with with England as well. So, you know, the the prince was never the one to um, you know establish doctrine, right? That was the role of the church, but it was the role of the prince to protect the church 
um, Luther wrote a treatise on, you know, Christian schooling that was to be public schooling. So I think a lot of the kinds of things that you see in early America are pretty similar to some of the things that were defended, you know, obviously no monarchy, but <laughs> in terms of uh, so some of the principles that you see laid down in Luther. Luther was also, um, you know, adamantly opposed to kind of public blasphemy as something that could be actually punished by the prince in some way. Um, he did not believe in the execution of heretics, though, that uh, which, you know, Calvin, at least in the case of Servetus, certainly did. Um, which I know is like the black market and Calvin's legacy. Everybody brings up survey to so, all the so time. So if I get a time machine, should I go back in time and s learn some French and snuggle up to Jean there and say, thing with don't, him, why don't you just sneak him out of the city somewhere? <laughs> Trust me, it'll go better for you in the future. I think so. I think so. Uh, Luther's got his black market too, which is his treatise on the Jews, but that's another question. Um, yeah, so, so there has always been... There's no under, and I would say there's no understanding prior to, you know, very recently that there's such a thing as a secular state. I mean, the idea of secularity, I think, is a, is a totally new concept. Um, I, the, the notion that you can have any kind of nation or culture that is just kind of religiously non-committal, I think, is just an absolute impossibility. I, I just, I don't think it works. Um, you, you have to have some kind of, some kind of idea of a unified common good. And without any idea of a common good, I just don't know that you can have a society. And, and we're starting to see that right now. Um, I, I think that liberalism in, in an American context worked because and only because there was a Christian uh, assumption on the part of the majority of the people in the United States. And so when you have kind of a common ground of, of morality, when you have a, a, a state that is you know, open to whatever, uh, in terms of personal freedoms, which that is also kind of mischaracterized by a lot of the left today too, historically. But, um, you know, when, when you have this kind of absolute freedom or this view of freedom as kind of non-constraint, freedom as the, the ability to just do whatever you want, um, without an underlying moral structure, it just doesn't work, which is why I think that the progressive left today it has so clearly created its own system of of morality its own kind of end goals it, it's really just i think copied what the church does in many ways it's, it's it's a religion and i know that a lot of people have said that you know it, this is a, the thing that a lot of people have um especially christian kind of commentators on where we are we're at socially but they they have their own eschatology right they have their own view of where the world is going they have their own idea of ethics they have their own version of excommunication i mean you can just go down the line um, on qu uh, answers to questions of like, what is a human? What is human nature? What is human identity? And, and those are the kinds of questions that I think we just don't, we're, we're seeing the results of not having those common answers as a culture right now. And I don't know what that means. I, I don't think it can end well, but I, I don't know where, where it goes. Uh, but in terms of Christian nationalism then and how that, that relates to this, um, I, I don't believe in a, a secular state. I don't think that there's such a possibility as having a secular state. You have to have moral judgments. That's what the law does. Uh, and even having laws that, you know, say, you know, don't do harm to another person, like that you are making a moral judgment. There, there's no such thing as an amoral law of the land. It just, you can't do it. Um, but what, what's going on right now in some of the, the talk, you know, the left is currently calling everybody a Christian nationalist uh, that has any idea that Christian has anything to do with our culture or our state at all. Uh, so it's become this term that just they throw around to refer to anybody they don't think, which, which they do in many other ways too. But then you also see some guys uh, who are on the far right now, uh, and I, I would say kind of on the fringe right, who have now co-opted that language and are pushing in an agenda that is not Christian. Uh, and, and I do think that there is, I mean, I, I've been just in the last week, this conversation has blown up and I've had all these people responding to me about how, uh, you know, there's a secret Jewish plot to control the world and how, you know, we need to segregate so that we have our own nations, that whites have their own nation and blacks have their own nation because we can't possibly mix cultures and all this kind of stuff. So, so what goes under the guise of Christian nationalism on the one hand is the left calls everybody a Christian nationalist, which would certainly include me and you. Uh, but then you have the far right that's not co-opted the term to refer to something that I think is not Christian either. So I, in light of where our conversations are, I'm like, just... The, the term is just not, I don't want to touch the term. <laughs> yeah, sure. Like, yeah. so, so that, that's kind of where I'm at with that issue. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a 
it's a dumb way to approach a really important debate. Yes. So I think a lot of this, a lot of this emerges from the the ongoing need to wrestle with religious pluralism. Yes. And in in some ways, this is there is a lot in the period of the reformational period that we can learn that has been deeply foundational, especially for the American system of trying to uh, recognize pluralism, uh, limit the yeah. power, limit the use of state power with respect to religious convictions. I mean, it's a it's a really delicate balance. It is recognizing that you you will not have a set of law without religious presuppositions and assumptions, no matter how implicit yep. or unconscious. While at the same time, also recognizing that you do need a degree of tolerance for pluralism among these things, and then to establish a system that actually can sort of keep those things together in a way that doesn't devolve into um, bloodshed in in how yeah. many different ugly ways. And it's really hard. And I don't, I don't, I mean, I don't have the answer for it. <laughs> I really and, and don't. We should feel, we should feel deeply grateful that in fact, despite the, because it is so very, very difficult yeah. in many ways in the United States with the dramatic exception of the American civil war, we, for the most part done better than one might expect, even given yeah. all of the you know, even given Jim Crow and, you know, all of the sanctioned use of violence or, or at least tolerated use of violence in our country, um, you know, we've we've in some ways done better than Europe. I think so. Absolutely. We've absolutely done better than Europe. So it's um, and, and what what frustrates me I, I, is when academics who should know know better use this term. People who know history use yes. this term, and I think this is this is this is just simply irresponsible Very because so. you know the United States has has always been a credo. It's always been credo nationalistic, not ethno nationalistic, yes. and that's that's an achievement, not a bug. And if we're going to continue to sustain this and pursue it, we're going to have to all. Um, take use care with the caution with the commons of language because language is a commons and it requires the responsible use of all within that commons which you know in terms of the rise of jordan peterson i think part of even though he didn't he didn't um identify it in this way um language is a commons that requires everybody's participation including the state um, of having yes. a degree of um, of toleration, and especially the use of state, the use of the state limiting its own power with respect to a number of these goods, and figuring out where state power is and is not appropriate. So, right, right. So. Well, good. Sounds like you, you know. I'm not surprised you and I are in, on some of the same pages on some of these things, just sort of given the um, some of the parallels in terms of because, of course, the Dutch reformed as opposed to the, say the young restless and reformed a little bit more magisterial still, even the Christian yeah, reformed yeah. church, which is a group of, um, of uh, schismatics in some ways, but that's not, that's not unusual in the Dutch reformed. <laughs> sure. So sure. Yeah. We've got our schisms too. <laughs> well, I Plenty had never of heard of the, um, what, what is your, uh, the AALC? The AALC. Yeah. Yeah, I'd never, I'd we, never heard of them. So. Yeah, we are. If I can just give you the kind of quick overview here, I know we can <laughs> probably end pretty soon. But uh, the the AALC is uh, essentially what was the, the remnants of what was the old ALC. So I don't know if you're familiar oh, with yeah. Lutheran World enough. So for those who aren't familiar, because it all gets complicated, but the uh, the ELCA was was a merger of three different church bodies that all came to join together to form this large Lutheran church body. And one of those church bodies that was part of the merger was the ALC, the American Lutheran Church. There were a group of congregations that said they didn't want to be part of that merger because um, they predicted exactly what happened with the ELCA. Um, it, 
which is, uh, you know, it's gone in all sorts of wild directions. You mentioned Nadia Bowles Weber, so there's a great example. Um, so the that group of churches said, we don't want to be part of, of this merge. We want to stay ALC. Legally, they couldn't keep the name ALC, so they stuck an extra A in front of their name and became the AALC. That, that's where we come from. Uh, we are we have since entered into full altar and pulpit fellowship with the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Okay. So uh, we have an official relationship with with them. So so theologically, we're we're really pretty much on the same page as the Missouri Synod. Okay. Um, we're just we have different roots, different background, different culture, that kind of stuff. Okay. Okay. Oh, very interesting. Very interesting. Well, good. I don't know if there's anything else anywhere else you want to go with this, or it's been it's been it's really been a delight to. You're, I, I much, I understand you much better now. I mean, a lot of oh, the good. videos I do interviews with people, people are surprised because especially if they've written a book, they, they want to debate the book or talk about the book. It's like, I'm much more interested in the person who wrote the book because then sure, when yeah. I read the book, I can much better understand the book mm -hmm. and contextualize the book. Sure. Um, because I know I, I, I have a better idea of who you are, where you're coming from, and and for that reason, where you want to go and yeah. where you want to take the rest of us. Yeah, yeah. Could I give a plug for my book though? While we're talking, about it? you certainly may <laughs> plug away. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've got uh, I've got a number of of books, but maybe like most relevant to some of these conversations is this one: "In Defense of the True, the Good, and the Beautiful on the Loss yeah. of Transcendence and the Decline of the West." So this is kind of my book that deals with a lot of the kind of broader issues that we're facing now in the uh, the meaning crisis. As uh, you know, I know some of you have called it. Uh, this is kind of my my response to that, which is, it's. I will say that it's not ex explicitly like Lutheran in context and in content, but uh, I think you'll see that Gerhard and some of those figures that I that I have uh, done a lot of research on really kind of help me to build uh, my case for where where I'm coming from on these issues. Well, you'll be happy to know that when I searched on Amazon, The Way of Salvation in the Lutheran Church, the similar books, the first one after it was The Defense of, In Defense of the, the True, the Good, and the Beautiful. Oh, so well, good. <laughs> Amazon is doing hear. its job. All right. I'm well, glad well, to let hear. Me, well, now, now you've raised, I'm just such a nosy person. Oh, no, um, you're fine. You're fine. Go for it. How, how, do you, how do you manage your time? I mean, how much, I mean, because book writing... I, I have part of the reason I started doing YouTube was because I have friends and colleagues who wrote books and yeah. book writing takes a ton of time. It does. And I, you know, some of my friends and colleagues who are wonderful pastors and I'm sure their books are great and they do wind up selling a few hundred of them. But then when they tell me, yeah, you know, if I, if I had to, if I, if I had to put a price tag on the, on the, you know, the, the wage per hour in terms of book writing, and that's kind of when I thought, you know, maybe I'll stick with videos. Um, so, well, my, my case a different is a little, thing. Sure. My case is a little different because though I used to write with other publishers, I have since started my publishing house and we publish a number of authors, including myself, uh, which means I actually get royalties off of my book that are more than like, you know, 20 cents a copy or something. Smart so, man. <laughs> <laughs> which like, and now I'm like, well, I've got a publishing house. I've already got the platform anyway. So that it's going to, you know, bring recognition to the book. So, you know, I might as well just put them out with my own publishing house. So it's worked out pretty well. Um, I, so a large part, part of my, um, you know, my, uh, my salary each month is, is book sales. Okay. So I, I do make a decent amount there. Um, it does take a lot of time. Uh, this is, this was my 10th book here. Uh, wow. So I, yeah, I've, I've done a lot. I, I'm writing my 11th right now, which is uh, I'm doing a, my major project, and I say this is probably my life project, is a what's projected to be nine volumes, and it may be more, but I have at least nine. Um, it's a it's a systematic systematic theology, kind of, but in some ways not really exhaustive. Is a systematic theology, but it is um, a really trying to recapture those 17th century categories, and specifically like a lot of classical thought. So, so I'm a I'm probably as much of a philosopher as theologian. So I'm, I'm, I'm a, you know, I really love Plato and Aristotle and, and the classics. Um, so I use them a lot. And I think that a lot of the kind of metaphysical foundations in those figures, once those were lost in the West with modernity, they began to seriously affect the way that we did our theology. So I'm trying to recapture a classical theology and basically show with each of these doctrines that I'm exploring kind of how 
especially in the kind of post-Kantian world, we've let the our, our I think false metaphysical assumptions start to shift our theology in various ways. So that's going to be a nine volume set. Right now, I've got my prolegomena, which is was my dissertation, which was you know edited uh, into a book. Um, so that's my defense of the of the methodology that I'm using. Um, and then right now, I'm working on um, the second volume in the series, which is on the doctrine of God. So that's what I'm doing right now. Uh, I'm also working through. If you looked at my YouTube channel, you probably saw that I. I I have a series called Makers of the Modern World, which I've been working on. It's a series of lectures on um, like modern modern thought in general. I started with Marx and reading a lot of uh, Marxists and then post-Marxists. And I'm trying to give an, an exploration of a lot of uh, specifically progressive thought and how we've gotten where we are, but do so from a, um, a very self-consciously Christian perspective. So I'm I'm hoping to take those lectures when I'm done and and do some kind of book on that as well. So that's probably an upcoming project. But in terms of how I like make time, I love writing. I, I think a lot of people just don't like it. I talk to authors that are like, I hate writing and I have to force myself to do it. Um, writing is what I like to do. You know, if, if I could do anything with my free time, it's probably right. I just, I, I, I love it. So oh, that's um, good. for whatever reason, I'm, I'm odd in that way. That, that I prefer writing over anything else. Um, so I, I, this is the reason I stopped blogging. I used to do blogging all the time, but then I realized like I spent all these hours writing this blog post, which people will read for about a week and then nobody cares about it anymore because it has to be like relevant for that week. Or I could spend that time writing something that I eventually put into a book. Um, but then I also try, because of my podcast, a lot of times I try to do research that's going to both be useful for the podcast and uh and books and i do the same with some of the stuff i've done in bible studies or ministry related things too so yeah. I, I try to kind of maybe double dip in t terms of my research and anybody in ministry is very quickly learns the uh efficiency of double dipping yeah, I <laughs> so. I it's so. it's one head it's all getting <laughs> poured through so you might as well yeah, yeah. get two or three different jobs out of it yeah well, yeah. well that's fine it sounds to me like there's a there's a lot of people who listen to this and they're gonna say boy i wish i had his job so but but part of the i mean part of the reality of vocation today is in many ways you do have to you do have to construct a platform that affords the vocation you want which is yes. different from let's say my father and my grandfather's generation where in many ways the church itself the the community sort of mm -hmm. created the platform and you built your vocation upon that platform and and many of those platforms just don't function like they used to anymore yep. right and the um the 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 broader platforms are um social media and a bunch of these things are are sort have sort of disrupted all of those traditional platforms so yeah interesting interesting well, Jordan, this has been this has been a delight. Um, I've really enjoyed this. I will I will send you um, I will send you a copy of this um, of this recording that you can use in any way you would choose to. I'll probably put it on put this on my channel this week, and um, I'll yeah. If there's... When, when do you expect this to get up? I don't know. Tomorrow, the next day, perhaps depends on if I if I have time today to make any other content for tomorrow. I usually try to put something out just about every day. Um, uh so that's so impressive send, that's more than i do well i don't know if it's impressive i mean you're you know when i listen to what you're doing in terms of your publishing um that's 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 longer term stuff it's hard to know going yeah, forward yeah. what that will mean but you know obviously looking backwards significant books changed the future dramatically right. and it's, right. it's hard to know with respect to not only individual platforms like a denomination but something like publishing print media how sure. that flows forward but um i i i worry sometimes that um no i don't know it's it's all these crazy vocational questions i have for myself which you'd think at the age of 59 i'd have that all sorted out but apparently yeah <laughs> So, um, but no, I will, I will send this to you. Send me any links you would like included in the notes that people can oh, sure. find your stuff. And, yeah, yeah, I um, can do that. 
because because I'm sure I'm sure some will some some will be interested. So all right, good. Thank Sounds you, good. Jordan. This was this was a lot of fun. I appreciate the conversation. We'll uh, maybe we'll we'll schedule something again. That's in the future. Good. All, right. All right, Jordan. Take care. Bye. Bye bye.